Hello, hello everybody, and uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to the New Poetry Society. My name's Henry Normal, and uh, I always have a I shall have a special poetry guest uh, for you again today. Uh, this is episode seven, and uh, it's brought to you by uh, Inspire for the Nottinghamshire Libraries and uh, from the Notts County Council, and also from uh, the Confetti and Metronome Group and the Nottingham Poetry Festival and um, the Arts Council and the NTU. So a lot of people involved to bring this here to you and um, they've been great so far and I'm really looking forward to today. So um, what we're gonna do, we're gonna do about an hour. Uh, so we'll be chatting, uh, we'll be reading poems and you'll get to uh, answer, uh, no, you get to ask some questions. Uh, you get to ask some questions We've got a, a chat facility down the side and we've got a Q&A facility. So if you type into those, but hold them for the moment, because we're going to, um, uh, you know, uh, do a bit before we answer some questions. So be about halfway through. I'll, I'll give you another shout a little bit later. So without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, one of my favourite uh, uh, poets. Um, and uh, she's... Um, not in Nottingham at the moment, but she's very much a, a Nottingham uh, name. Please welcome uh, Cleo Assombre Old. Hey, hey, Cleo. Hey, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Now, I, I said your name com completely right. I mean, the most important part was that you got Assombre right. Um, yeah, oh, I know good. once I did a gig and I asked if you could not say alt, but you did it this time. Oh, oh, no. I'm reading it off your bit on the. On the <laughs> I let it slide. It's fine. All oh, right. Okay. It's, it's only because you've got it up there. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have done it. Mm, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, go, anyway, you've uh, um, you get it. You get more of a spread uh, uh, if you use your full name. Yeah. You know I mean, uh, um, in publicity, you get you get you get more space. <laughs> so, uh, how, how you been doing during uh, lockdown? Have you? Um, uh, have you been coping? Have you been being creative? Yeah, I have. Um, lockdown's actually, I mean, it started off pretty terrible, to be honest. I think maybe similar for most people. So I was furloughed from my job and then um, made redundant. And that was my first kind of professional publishing role. And I thought, oh, man, how am I going to turn this around in the middle of a pandemic? And um, I'm actually working at Penguin Random House now across, um, well, at Ebury for Vermilion and Ryder, the two imprints that I work for. Um, and it's the happiest I have ever been in my life. I feel so fortunate. Um, and very, very, now, very pleased. To, somebody, who's, somebody who's actually um, thriving in in the in the in the pandemic uh, which is great I'm, I'm i'm very glad to hear that you know uh, you, you hear of uh, daisies pushing through concrete don't you uh, you do, um, you do. Yeah, so how about we, you henry me I, i'm doing all right i uh, yeah I, I found i found the first bit of lockdown because it was such a change i found mm. that very motivating to actually yeah. try to understand it so I, I wrote a lot of stuff in the early lockdown obviously now we, we've got used to it so much so my thoughts are turning to um obviously spring and and, mm -hmm. uh, and trying to get out and about so I, i'm tentatively sort of uh, writing and, and thinking about that uh, have, you, have you written any poems during the lockdown yeah, I actually have. So I was part of um, Gob's Collective, um, spearheaded by Bridie Squires. I just adore her. Um, and I came up with a sort of a video that I made at home about um, I got locked in my bathroom over lockdown. Um, the door handle came off. And I was actually trapped in the bathroom. I, I had to, I mean, luckily I had a pair of scissors and mm. I managed to put that through like the hole in the door to get out. Otherwise I would have been stuck in there. So I did a piece about kind of being locked down in my bathroom during lockdown. Um, and I also, I did write a second lockdown piece as well. And um, I experienced a lot of anxiety in the first bit of lockdown after I'd lost my job. And um, I did write a piece about that, which I shared um, during a showcase that was part of Gob's Collective as well. So I've been doing a few That's bits. So, so the, the, the one about your bathroom, is that is that on uh, YouTube? It is. It's it's on the tube. So, <laughs> so, so if, you, if you type in uh, Cleo Asambra. Cleo uh, um, and, Asambra, and, and, darling. And bathroom, will, will it come up? <laughs> it's called um, Bathroom Lockdown on Berridge Road. I think it might come up, or if you search Gob's Collective Showcase, you might be able right. to find it. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll do that. But uh, I, I, and uh, I I I know you dress up sometimes. Are you in your bathrobe for this? <laughs> 
Um, no, I'm actually not. But the piece is filmed through the hole in the door, and that oh, was no. all I that was all I could see um, out yeah. of when I was stuck in there. There were no windows. There's no windows in that bathroom, and so I thought, you know what, I'm going to film it from the kind of viewpoint what you'd be able to see if you were on the outside. Yeah. Um, and it was it was really claustrophobic, and I was just trying to capture that in the way that it was filmed. And I'm totally amateur. I've got no experience, and I thought I'll try and do something a bit different. Think up think outside the box yeah, so, yeah. well yeah, for claustrophobia outside the box is the best place 100 percent. yeah now, uh, i'd like to get some poems in today so uh, have you got a poem you could read us oh um i actually don't have any poems i didn't realize that's what <laughs> yeah yeah so my first piece um it's called um they know better and it's actually about um so I'm often described as looking racially ambiguous. And sometimes, um, I mean, there's it's fine to have a curiosity about that and ask questions, kind of, where are you from? But there are just times when it feels like it crosses a bit of a line or it feels uncomfortable or inappropriate. And um, it's just about some of the experiences that I've had. And sometimes people tell me, oh, like, you're definitely not from there. Why would you even say that? Like, you're obviously Spanish or something. Um, so my first piece is about that. And it's kind of, I thought I'll share it first because it's kind of about identity and this is me. So this is my first poem. Let's just say they think that I'm lying and know better than I do where I come from. It's tiring when they tell me I'm Spanish, Mediterranean or South American. Sorry, but you're wrong. But of course, they know better than I do where I come from. They tell me I'm Cypriot, Turkish, Croatian, Hungarian, maybe. Sorry, you're wrong. But of course, they know better than I do where I come from. Colombian, Portuguese, Algerian, Mexican, Italian. And I wonder, what's the significance in all of this? Until my thoughts are quickly interrupted when half Indian gets thrown in the mix. Then I wonder, am I just an ambiguous bag of tricks people take it upon themselves to try and unpick? Then they get cynical when I tell them I'm not, because really all that I am is a human and none of the above. So try not to put me in any kind of box. For instance, when I joined a Nottingham comedy club, first session, we stood in a circle, asked purposeful questions and introduced ourselves, compelled as we spoke of our reasons for joining. As part of the homework, I'd coined my first joke in a journal. I felt ready to share the material. I laid myself bare before reading aloud, proudly stating my name and racial background, said I couldn't even count on both hands the times I've been told I'm making it up when I say my granddad's Ghanaian. No, on my life you look more European, they say, or a spice of something more Middle Eastern. As I was speaking, I soon noticed a bloke in the circle over out staring his welcome. His nonverbal communication made me uneasy and he came over at the end of the session to say so breezily freely, you're not anything remotely close to Ghanaian. That's not where you're from. Sorry, I've just lost my place. Was it part of your comedy act? Or why are you trying to be something that you're not? Look at this, my skin, it's darker than yours. We could even be twins and I'm nothing but English. Then there's the salon off Market Square. And I really was happy to just be there for a head massage and a trim. But after the cut, my curls were asked to leave by a blow dry and pair of conformist GHDs. Sorry, I said but I'm over my hair being scorched and singed. And why is it even the standard thing to make it straight? Hairdressers and strangers have said all sorts of things. It's way too thin, there's way too much, then it's not straight enough. It's dry or winds unruly like corrugated iron. Sorry about those unlucky jeans and I really don't mean to be mean, but your levels of frizz are pretty horrific. Though I suppose you're lucky it's colored like honey. Tell me again. Where did you say you get that from? And the list just goes on and on. So all there is to do is to keep trying. But let's just say they think that I'm lying and know better than I do where I come from. It's tiring when they tell me I'm Spanish, Mediterranean or South American. Sorry, 
you're wrong. But of course, they know better than I do where I come from. They tell me I'm Cypriot, Turkish, Croatian, Hungarian maybe. Sorry, you're wrong. But they know better than I do where I come from. Colombian, Portuguese, Algerian, Mexican, Italian. And I wonder, what is the significance in all of this? Until my thoughts are quickly interrupted when half Indian gets thrown in the mix. Then they get cynical when I tell them I'm not, that I'm none of the above because all that I am is a human. And isn't that all that we are human, really? That's all I am, same as you and the rest of us here, a human, really. That's all I am, same as you and all those you love. And really, isn't that good enough? Oh, that is brilliant. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Thanks. Sorry, I messed up the beginning. It's been a while since I performed. I'm a bit jittery, um, but it's okay. Yeah, um, I, I couldn't possibly remember all that. Uh, in in uh, you know, not even not even in my youth. I I, I admire uh, your performance skills, but more than that, I admire the writing because uh, it's when you when you do something that's so accessible. Mm. People think it's easy, but it's not easy. And I love the the structure of it, the repetition, the uh, rhythm, the uh, you know the the way you've constructed uh, the the narrative. And I know you do this in all your poems. Um, there it looks so easy, but it's not. And it's it's beautiful, and it pulls you along. So where did, where did this style come from? Um, I think I've just always, uh, well, since I started writing properly when I was about, um, I've written for my whole life, but I think it was when I was part of the poetry collective Mouthy Poets that I started to think less about myself in terms of the performance and more about the audience and how I can entertain them, how I can grab them. And this doesn't, I mean, this is from my experience, but I don't want it to be, oh, this is just relatable to me. Um, so I think it was kind of starting to take my work to the stage and wanting to feel like I'm delivering something here um because you don't want to be stood up on stage and thinking oh god like everyone's bored or they can't well, um, connect to something that's in this piece so yeah, I always they, try they and think chance, they? They, they get one yeah. chance to hear it and, and so exactly a, a piece that you do in performance as opposed to a written piece where you can go back over it you yeah got to try and get at least an essence of, of what you do i mean i, I know your poems because i've seen them on the page and you can go over them uh, and, uh, and enjoy more than uh, than the performance but uh, that's it's a great and uh, of course you came to uh, to nottingham you're, you're brought up in uh, in london so when did you first start um uh, if i can use the word identifying uh, as a poet when did you first start thinking of yourself as a poet Oh, God, um, I still don't know if I do. It's so hard. Um, <laughs> but pro probably when I was about um, 21, 22, and I was starting to get paid for gigs and things like that. And um, it felt like, oh, maybe this is like semi professional kind of thing now. Um, but it is hard. I mean, it's the same thing when people ask if you're a writer, you feel like, oh is that when you reach a certain point or when you've had a book published kind of thing when can you actually say I am a poet I am a writer I would usually say I write poems or I do write sometimes because it feels like I don't know it's a it's a confidence thing I think to actually say I am this if that makes sense but yeah, yeah. no, no I, 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 I obviously went through that myself and uh, the, the idea of uh, I mean obviously before you performed you took the decision to sit and write these things. So that in itself is, is a huge step. Uh, yeah. and, but but the, the, you know, you could be doing anything. You could choose to do anything, but mm -hmm. to, to actually write, um, that, that's quite a big step. Can you remember anything about the, the, your thought process in, in that, that step to actually sit and write? Um, with that particular poem or just in general? Just, uh, just uh, the, the start of your, uh, your writing uh, experiment. And at the start of my writing experiment. So um, the first thing I wrote, I think, was about six years old. <laughs> and, 
Yeah, it was all about um, animals. And I basically plagiarized the whole of the animals of Farthing Woods and made my own, what I was saying, this is my book. And um, my best friend from primary school, um, Eloise, who I saw for the first time in um, about 15 years, just at the weekend, actually, she did the illustrations and she's still into artsy stuff now. But that was my first. And I knew, oh, I love writing. And it's just kind of stayed stayed with me but generally I tend to write stuff um when I feel compelled to um I do keep a journal regularly but in terms of actually coming up with a poem it's when I think oh this needs to be something I've got to get it out of my system kind of thing no I I I um I, I find it's a, it's a communication obviously and sometimes you're communicating with yourself and sometimes you're communicating with other people I'd like to read you one of mine this yes is, please uh, it's, uh, people um, people send off things off to poetry competitions, and I've never quite understood the idea of being in competition. Um, I mean, I, I you know, I, I love your, <laughs> your poems, but I can't imagine, you know, one of my poems being in competition with one, or your poems being in competition with each other. It's, yeah. It seems such a strange idea that, that like, like these paintings behind me are in competition with each other in some strange way. Creativity doesn't uh, for me is not to do with uh, uh, competition so this is called uh, um, the measuring of worth it's uh, it's a sort of an attempt at a sonnet but uh, not that uh, not that much no my art is not in competition it does not beat out time racing others it's not bigger or louder than any others I would not say that all art should be like mine or that my art is of a special significance its only claim it has come to exist. It is something, it is sometimes hard to hear your own heart. I've listened well to the arts of others and found some comfort in their tone and pulse. Here is the most intimate of murmurs. I offer as a tiny SOS, the warmth and persistence of my own lifeblood, merely the echoes of a human heart, yet perhaps reminiscent your own very humble that is so so lovely but it's, it's interesting isn't it? because I, when i when you were talking about the joy of writing that poem that you remember as a kid mm. um, the act of creation uh, i think is is such a beautiful thing and uh, um i say my son uh, really enjoys painting these. if i burn these he won't he, he wouldn't even bother about it he'll just paint some just more, do a load more uh, yeah so this question of when you call yourself uh, a poet and when you call yourself a writer i think if you write anything or you do a poem uh, or even if you think poetically you can call yourself uh, uh, um, uh, a poet i think okay. it's it's a, probably a way of looking at the world yeah, I think you're probably right. You're really putting me to shame with that background. I must <laughs> well, I can I can send you some. We've got hundreds of them in the garage. Gladly, gladly. I've got a, a good like a space here where they would go perfectly. So please do. Yeah. Now, um, uh, you talked uh, there about uh, uh, mouthy poets. Yeah. Uh, and you talked about gobs which I know is, is, is sort of, in, in a way, uh, connected. Uh, um, um, tell, tell us, because uh, these are Nottingham uh, institutions, tell us a bit about Mouthy Poets and Gobs. Okay, so Mouthy Poets sadly aren't um, running anymore. Um, it was to do with funding and stuff, but um, so they were going for, I want to say about eight years or something. And I got involved when I was 19, when I was in my first year of uni and kind of, feeling very out of my depth and struggling with the social side um, and a lot of privilege. Like I, I just didn't really fit in and it was tricky. And then I was brought in by Deborah Stevenson after doing a poetry module on my BA with her. And um, it was like people from the city itself where they were just kind of very down to earth what I like to call normal people who I could relate to and who could relate to me as well. And we would meet every Friday for three hours and do some writing, do some workshopping and performance and stuff. And it was, it, it was a massive saving grace for me. And it made me feel like I was properly held by the people of Nottingham, to be honest. And oh, got nice. a lot. yeah. And the fact that we did performances, like uh, we did two performances a year and that really helped with general confidence and feeling part of a community. And then after um, Mouthy Poets disbanded, Bridie fortunately, thankfully set up Gobs Collective and um, she's doing loads of stuff with them and it's wicked. Um, so oh, check great. them out. 
Now, Bridie was in our first episode, um, which is now available on the Inspire uh, website, if you go on to that. And all these episodes will be recorded, as they are today, uh, and will be on the, uh, the website. So uh, uh, if you have to go and you want to see how it ends, uh, um, it will be there. And if you want to tell your friends to watch it, uh, um, they, these will all be up on the Inspire website at, at some point. Um, yes, no, Bridie is, is a force of nature and uh, really you know, <laughs> there's a lot for the community, which is which is great. Yeah. Um, so you and I went on a, an Arvon course, not not together. We, <laughs> we, we, we found each other there, didn't we, at a, an Arvon course? Yes, that's where we found each other. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> And and uh, and uh, uh, did you enjoy it? What 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 did it um, what did it what did you get from the course? I loved it. So um, someone who I'm still really close with, I met there, um, and she's a teacher. Um, and I think like it was in the lead up to my dissertation when I was doing my masters and I was doing this creative project. And the actual Arvon we went to was on putting a first collection together. If you yeah remember and it was just perfect timing for me because it was in September I mean it was late August early September and my hand in was early October so I was kind of just chipping away at the poems um because we had um I'm trying to remember the names of the tutors now um Sandeep and the other guy's name Fred de Guar, um and they were really helpful in terms of just suggesting ideas and other kind of influences and stuff but the location was beautiful I was I was very well, was Ted, Ted, Ted Hughes's uh, old place yeah. yeah did you see Sylvia Plath's grave I did and I, I um uh, yes I, I did and uh, I was I was very struck by the fact um that uh, the graves either side tell you the age of the person but Sylvia Plath's doesn't mm. So uh, it looked like it was particularly omitted because she died young. She was very young. Yeah, very I, young. I notice these things. I'm always looking at patterns. Yeah. One of the things we do as a poet is to look, look at patterns. Now, you, you, so you've been working on a book. Uh, um, have you got a book out at the minute? Well, my dad will slate me for this. He's always <laughs> telling me, come on, Cleo, get your collection out there before you're 30, before you're over the hill kind of thing. <laughs> um so I'm working on it and I will get there in my own time I've just I've been so busy and um with work like because I'm really enjoying it I'm kind of throwing myself into that but the collection will will materialize at some point and I came up with something for my MA as well so I've got I've got the material it's just about you know putting it out there and I love I love that your dad uh, is encouraging you I, I think that's beautiful. But the only thing my dad ever said to me, he saw me in performance once and he said, um, do you talk fast uh, uh, in case it's not funny, then it's not so far to the next joke. <laughs> I thought you've got it absolutely right, dad. I am. <laughs> Just, he'd, normally, he'd normally say after about half an hour, he'd normally say, yeah, sure up and let your sisters have a go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Henry. <laughs> now, um, I know that you've got some poems in an anthology, haven't you? Um, uh, Our Voices. Our voices, our verses, here, this really beautiful collection that was illustrated by Emily Catherine. Yeah. Um, so this was put together for the four finalists of the Nottingham Young Poet Laureate search. So I have five pieces in here and oh. it's really nice. And it's kind of my first kind of um, uh, intro into having something published, I suppose. And I Brilliant. think it looks, it looks beautiful. Brilliant. Um, now, can, you, can, you give, can you give us another poem then? I will, yeah. So I've got a poem, it's called Tomatoes, and um, it's about just eating cheese and tomatoes with my mum. So I wrote it last summer, and um, it was after having all that, all the difficulty with losing my job, and I didn't have any kind of hope on the horizon yet, and I felt out of touch with everything. And then I had this moment with my mum where I felt like, I'm experiencing joy again. So um, this is a poem about that and there's a bit of singing in it. So I'll try and stay in tune while I'm nervous. <laughs> so here we go. This is Tomatoes. <laughs> Lazing in the kitchen on a late summer afternoon. Fragrant of you. There'll never be tomatoes like those we had that Indian summer afternoon. 
sitting on wicker chairs facing each other, juice slipping from your lips to drip into chin crease, our pink plates slicked with olive oil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Buoyant green, red and golden tomatoes glistening. We dipped them in sea salt, doused them in fresh lemon juice, savouring the feast, fished out stray lemon pips, knowing we'd scoff the lot of our tomato tequila shots, knives and forks at the ready. For da 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 dining on tomatoes in the kitchen on a late summer afternoon. You know when nothing's missing and everything's cool. I lean towards you. Into the warm through breeze, stab a golden tomato, its sweet tang dissolving in one mouthful, then another and another slathered in cashew nut cheese. I worry, we're ploughing through these. You say, life's short and to be enjoyed, my dear, as you lick your plate clean, then fill it up again. Stuffing faces in the kitchen, guilt-free and very simply lovely. The tang of tomatoes leans into me on quiet summer days. That salt, that lemon, that olive oil never quite the same. Summer's past, I make a mug of tea, scrub knives and forks clean, holding fond you here and the tomato memory that life is short and to be enjoyed, my dears. So please lick your plates clean. Wow, that is gorgeous. That is good. Mm -hmm. you know, um, it's funny, isn't it? It, it's almost like a photograph, uh, um, uh, you, you know, and uh, there's something lovely about photographs because th th it's a memory that you can encapsulate. And mm -hmm. in a poem, I think you can encapsulate more, more than just um, the visual side of it. You can ca encapsulate something of the feeling. And certainly as, as you uh, perform it there, you get something. Of, so it's, it, it's a, an interesting way of, of capturing a feeling. Um, and yeah. I, 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 when people say to me sometimes about poetry, um, I think, well, the things that you can't write a novel about and you, it's too long and you, you can't do a short story about and you, and, and, and as an art form, it, it's brilliant for capturing certain things. I, I, I think you've demonstrated that there, that it's, uh, you know, capturing that moment and that feeling. It's a, it's a great communicator of feeling. Thank you so much. What I'm actually really enjoying about this is that, it, I mean, it's live and it's just being recorded as it is. And I'm a massive perfectionist. And I know that so far I'm kind of like, this isn't perfect. I'm gonna get out of the <laughs> I forgot a line, but I'm trying to sort of just let my hair down going forwards. And cause there's been so much that I've put on myself in terms of pressure to think if you make a mistake, it, that is the worst thing. And um, it's kind of ruined my life for the longest time. And I'm not letting that happen anymore. Yeah, so I, 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 like, um, I, like, I like the fact that Persian carpets are always made with a mistake. <laughs> okay. Um, I was wondering where you were going with that. Yeah, no, I, I like the because only God can make a uh, a perfect carpet. And I like the fact that they do a deliberate mistake. And I, I think oh, one yeah. of the things I found, you see, about poetry uh, uh, and humour, uh, and mm -hmm. you're, you're of a, a you know use humour uh, a lot. And uh, um, I think it it's it's one of our ways of coming to terms with imperfection. Yeah, because, sure. because we're not perfect. No, and we're not. We don't need to be. Yeah. Word mm. to that. Yeah, in fact, do you know what? If we were perfect, it'd be a bit boring. I fully agree. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, so you've had some commissioned poems, haven't you? I have. I feel really, about them. really fortunate. So they kind of, they really did push me out of my comfort zone. So the first one was for a law firm based in Nottingham called um, Shakespeare Martineau. And they wanted me to write this piece um, about how COVID had 
uh, affected them and how they'd adapted to it and stuff. Um, and obviously, I would never think to write about law. <laughs> so yeah. it was really interesting doing it. And they were so happy with it. And it was a massive thing for me to know, oh, I can write this and the company are actually going to be happy with the results. Um, and then I had another one for um, City University of London for their history and politics BA. Um, and I really enjoyed that. And the video is quite sort of contemporary. And I had a lot of fun with it. And I can be quite camera shy, but I really appreciated um, the company called Dynamite who did the filming and got the commission. Um, and they just made me feel really comfortable and at ease. And, and, and uh, uh, Cleo, can, can, can we see this on YouTube or anywhere? Is there a place we can watch it? I think it might be on Vimeo. I am so camera shy, but yeah. On, Vi my, on Vimeo. This might be on Vimeo. All right, okay, okay. I bet, yeah, that's a new one on me, Vimeo. I'll, I'll, oh, I'll it? look it out. Okay, yeah, you look it out. Yeah, okay. Now, um, we're going to ask uh, um, people to send in their questions. So if you've got any questions for, for Cleo, uh, send them either into the chat or into the Q&A. Let me have a press my Q&A button here. Uh, no open questions at the moment on there. Let's have a look on the chat. Facility. You can have a look on the chat facility as well, Cleo, and help my... Uh, I'm just uh, trying to work it out. I mean, somebody's asked, can we see some of the illustrations in the poetry anthology book, please? I don't know if there's... Go for it. Let's see. I don't know if there are any. I think there might be photographs. I'm not sure about actual illustrations, though. Um, yeah, there are. there's just photographs in there. So the illustrations are just kind of on the back. Let's have a look at one of the photos. And on the um, cover. Okay. Photos. There might be a group one. I don't just want to show you a photo. Oh, they're, they're just photos of, uh, of the people involved. Yeah. So um, this is Ty Healy, who's a poet and a rapper. And yeah. he is such a wonderful person and brilliant artist as well. So if you want to kind of check someone else out, he is right. one of so, so have you got a photo in there? Have I? Yeah. Yeah, my, my big old face. That's a, lo uh, yeah, yeah. It's a lovely photo, that one. Me. So you've got, you've got, you've got a, um, a very uh, interesting makeup on on that. Where, was that taken at a festival or something? It was for Pride and it's Pride Month now. So shout out to Pride as well. Yeah. I think it's Pride Month. I hope it is Pride Month right now. Uh, <laughs> I, I used, uh, uh, when I start, got back into poetry, because uh, I, I had a little bit of a break where I was doing some television. Uh, when I got back into it, I used photographs as a way of, of leading me in. Mm. That's obviously with a photograph, you've got an image. Uh, and it's quite interesting what that image can do to your your feelings. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you know, I, I find inspiration in in all sorts of things like that. Um, do you have a particular um, uh, way you, you 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 know go to find inspiration? Do you just sit in a garden, or you know, do, do you have a, a particular desk? Or um, I think I generally tend to write when it's like what I said before, when I feel compelled to, I mean, with that tomatoes one for a specific example, uh, the moment had just happened in the kitchen and I went out into the front garden because that gets a lot of sun. And I just wrote that piece in one go, basically. And that was it. And I felt like I just needed to get that. I needed to capture that kind of thing. Um, and that is generally, I mean, I should write in a more kind of like set aside, I don't know, an hour a day or something, because that would get me writing more regularly, because um, the journal stuff is a regular thing. But in terms of actually putting poems together, I haven't been as consistent with that recently. Yeah, so, so sometimes they creep up on you. That's what I, I, do, I find. Do, yeah. yeah. And but sometimes even when you haven't got a pen, so you've got to, you've got to you're oh, no. remembering them. <laughs> well, what about your phone? Or is that not you? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I have, I have, I have written uh, uh, you know, little notes on my phone. Voice uh, recording. Especially, especially on the well. beach. On the beach, if if you if you've uh, but if you're on a phone uh, on a beach, people look at you as if to say. Can you not look at the majesty of what's around you? Even when you're putting down a brilliant liner, capturing the majesty. You're in Brighton, aren't you, Henry? I, I think am, I yes. right. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. And uh, we've got, uh, obviously, Pride's very good here. We yes. have a very uh, good celebration. Yeah. Um, now, uh, has anybody else written? Let's have a little look. No. Now, I know you've got a poem uh, uh, from your anthology. Oh, with. yes, I do. Um, so this is a poem called I Shouldn't Even Have to Ask. And um, I guess it is kind of relevant to now because it's sort of about making 
uh, like we feel quite confined at the moment. And um, this poem is about feeling free um, and movement. I wrote it in, um, I went to Germany with Nazi poets on our, we went on a tour, which is yeah. hilarious, but also amazing. <laughs> um, and we did a dance workshop and um, it was Bridie and I uh, dancing to the last track. And I just felt like, this is so, this is really lovely. And um, I wrote this piece called, I shouldn't even have to ask. And um, I have had music to it before, which is so nice, but this time it will be just as it is. Okay. Your skeleton in right angles, your shoulders scooping back. There is none of that worry limbo here, just movement. So let us dance because life is hard. Damn, is it hard? And a lot of the time talking is tiring or your mind aches or there just isn't anything left to say. But mostly we could all really do with using our bodies in so many more ways than we give them credit for. Credit we all pushed out, umbilical cords still connected, screaming for this life. So contort innards, bones and spines knuckles, irises, eyelids, pinkies, so they are jiving together, moving to music. You know the kind, the kind of dance you want to do when you're commuting to work. Headphones in and a jig would seem maybe a little out of line. But I bid you please, don't be ashamed next time and do it as the sun rises when there's still morning rosewood pink in the sky. Can you imagine if we all just let go a little to make flesh crash and catapult at 8am? I'm sure we'd be laughing aloud and so much happier for it. Our bodies entirely at ease in open space, nobody caring what they look like. We just want to keep moving. We just need to keep moving and we can only keep moving, arching our backs, moles and freckles realigning, our figures becoming a worm kneecaps liquefied and elbows palming at the air. Now, I am not one for attention and I can be content as long as the focus isn't on me. So sometimes I wonder why on earth I even do these poetry things. But I think it's because it helps me to imagine all of us if we all just danced on our way in or way home from school or work. I shouldn't even have to ask what that might be like just bodies sashaying with none of them caring who might be watching would be pretty lovely and get us all smiling like maybe life could be better than this crazy anxiety simulator that it is. That's a great poem. Do you know, I wish I, wish, I, wish I could be uh, uh, um, unself-conscious. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I think I stepped back about the age of 11. Uh, um, and uh, and I've been self-conscious ever since, uh, and yeah. very very aware of what's going on around me. But it is bliss. It is bliss. You know when I, when I, I tell you when I wasn't self-conscious when yeah. I used to play football as as, as a lad, uh, um, because you're just in the moment. It's a bit. Exactly. You, know, you know, football is actually dancing for lads. Uh, no, I I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah, because you're just focused so wholly on that, and you're not Enjoy, thinking about enjoying your body uh, yeah. and and just just being just being. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that, that's that's. I think the only time I could say that that um, that you know. Uh, I mean, it's great, really. Uh, mm -hmm. That um, you know, people can get that from dancing and other physical activity. Um, Probably meditation as well. I've, I've never yeah. tried that. Yeah. So do you, you, you're a big dancer. You like dancing. I mean, when I can go out and dance, I do like to shake a leg. So, <laughs> but it's been a while. It really has. I mean, before this, because I do get nervous, I did blast some music and have a little drive around my room. But it'd be nice to be able to um, move with some people when when it's possible. Yeah. All right. Now, um, you have had quite you. A few, you have you you there i've had quite a few different jobs on you now you're telling me that uh, you work for the council yes as a children's um, placement officer social care yeah uh, social care mm. and and you work for uh, left lion i did the magazine yeah and you worked in newark 
I did work in Newark, which is an anagram for something that I really cannot say on here because it's rude. I'm going um, to work that out later. Rhymes with banker. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so I worked um, for Trigger Publishing in um, Newark and um, that was my first kind of, I got 12 months experience uh, yeah. working in nonfiction publishing, which really helped me get my job now at Penguin. So I'm very grateful. Oh, brilliant. Well, we'll hear a bit more about uh, Penguin. Uh, do uh, send us any questions in, if you've got any. Um, I'm going to read you one of my poems. It's only a short one, as, as most of them are. If you don't want to get to the edge of the page, uh, uh, Cleo, that, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm done then. I don't want to turn it over. Um, this is one uh, I, I mentioned to you. This is, this is me in my 20s. This is one I, I, I wrote in my 20s, and I thought uh, as soon as I got... Uh, um, you know, uh, a young person on today. I, I try and reminisce at uh, how I felt in, in me in my twenties. And strangely enough, this this one has actually been read at somebody's funeral, um, oh. which um, I, I found strange uh, when I when I wrote it. But um, uh, you know, obviously, as you get older, um, things fit into place more. It's called the poem within you. Opened to the chill of the room is the poem deep inside you. You shrug and feign dismissal, but it's as you'd hoped. It is your poem. Private and sacred, it belongs to you alone. Guarded and enshrined, it's the very heart of you. You are concerned for its progress. You're both embarrassed and proud. And in an act of defiance, in an act of pure humanity, you hold out your poem, sure that it has its place. Open to the chill of the room is the poem deep inside you. And for a moment, the room is warmed. And in that moment, you are content. And in a world of such poems, how can anyone die? Lonely and cold. I was always concerned with death in my youth. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. I think it's part of that being self-conscious and knowing. Well, I do know why. My mum died when I was 11. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it sort of brought death to the fore, as it were. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got humour to help us cope with it. Uh, we do. With your poems, Henry, I found that they're, they, they're quite serious. But then you as a person are very light and funny. Um, and that's just that's just something I've observed. Yes, well, uh, I, I, we we don't want anybody slitting the wrists with the uh, the edge of the pages, do we? No, that be, we that don't. Would, that would be awful. Yeah. Would be awful. Let's see. Have we, have we got any uh, any uh, questions in yet? Oh, there are some in the Q and A. That's all oh, in the Q and A. Good, right? Let's read read one out, Cleo. Oh, um, somebody has asked. As someone who's very open, it's an anonymous attendee. As someone who's very open about their anxiety, how do you overcome this when performing? Okay, sometimes I feel like I don't. Um, that's the honest answer, but I um. I force myself to do it sometimes. Breathing does help me and knowing that I will feel really good after I've done a performance always helps. And um, I think doing something on a regular basis also uh, helps you feel a bit less overwhelmed by it. But there, there have been a few times in the past, I'm not gonna lie, where um, I was doing a performance for Mouthy Poets and I was a teddy bear in a onesie with two other people. And um, I said to them before we went on stage, I'm not doing it, I cannot do it. I mean, I've got a really <clears throat> dicky tummy all the time. My stomach was in knots and um, they were just like, what, <laughs> come on. And I said, no, like, I'm not. But in the end, I got up on stage and um, it went really well. And sometimes that nervous energy can propel you, but hands up yes I have struggled with anxiety in a in a serious way and it, it isn't always easy but I think it's um kind of you have to challenge those thoughts um and that is that is my that's my best way of coping with it challenge the thoughts and know I am good enough and I can do this it's an ongoing battle though so it's not like oh yeah it's a breeze at all it's it's a challenge but that makes it all the more rewarding I, lo I love that. I love that. And, uh, you know, I know that, uh, you know, uh, people, um, uh, most people I've found that actually perform are actually quite shy. Yeah. Uh, it's a, I think it's a fallacy to think that people who perform are uh, extroverts. They're usually introverts that make an effort 
yeah and, and as you say challenge themselves i know that's certainly the case with me and i remember seeing you uh we filmed you didn't we for uh, knots tv mm-hmm. uh, and uh, you were doing a very long piece which uh you you know, memorized and uh, you're in front of an audience and uh, and um, you you had difficulties uh, with it and uh, but you pers- persevered uh, and uh, and you you know kept uh, at it and i know that we we filmed it again later and you you uh, you did it again later oh that was yeah it was the technical difficulties wasn't it that's right and i i love i love the fact that that you know as well as talent and as well as um you know an eye for uh, a line and and structure and all that one of the things i think you need creatively is um um uh, stamina uh, and perseverance and uh, people don't tend to think of those things in terms of writing and, and performing but uh, I think you know they're they're very much part of it aren't they that it, yeah. it's, it's it's not a um a casual flash thing it's something that you, you work in uh, you know and obviously you're uh, you know early on in your career uh, and can imagine how brilliant you're going to be when you're my age I feel like I'm getting old <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah well people when they're young do that's the weird thing I, I was older in my 20s than I am now strangely enough okay yeah I'm sure your dad will say the same <laughs> so um uh but uh, br- brilliant that you're doing that now okay is there any other now there's a question I've just seen in the uh, Q&A mm-hmm. that said um all art is theft mm-hmm. who do you steal from uh where do I steal from um oh man I'm just trying to think I mean with that tomatoes piece, I'd read um, the poem Strawberries. I'm trying to remember the name of the writer, um, but that did have an influence on that poem. But generally, I must say, most of the stuff comes from the heart and the brain of this yeah. one. Well, and you know, I, I think the thing is that what we do is we look at the world. I mean, I, I wrote The Royal Family, and basically The Royal Family, the first episode is just lines that our mum and dad said, right? Yeah. But I think it's about looking at the lines. It's not so much stealing. It, it's being in a in a position and looking at the juxtapositions of the things around you and, and noting them down. Uh, and, and throughout your life, all the, the bits that go into your brain form these uh, alignments and juxtapositions. And then when you see something, they fall in line with your brain. And all these things that, you, that you're that you taking in are all from other people. So in, in terms of art being exactly. theft, uh, obviously we don't live in a vacuum. So we're, we're influenced by them, but, but the amalgam of them and the way that you put them onto the page or the way you perform them uh, uh, can be unique because only you have all those brain connections from your birth to, to, to now. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does make sense. Yeah, so, so you know, I mean, if you, if you directly stole a line, that, that would be another thing, you know, uh, or if you, you know, you, you, you painted the Mona Lisa, that, that would be a different <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah. But in, by uh, taking influences from here and there, I just think that's natural. It is, it is, and it will happen without you even realising. It can be such a subconscious thing as well. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you, because uh, uh, we've got about... Uh, um, eight minutes, uh, nine minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask you um, if you'll uh, read, because I know it's quite a long poem, uh, your baker's poem, because you were a baker for a while, weren't you? I was. I was a baker for about two years. And um, I have my baker's hat at the ready. Um, so, yeah, I worked at Sainsbury's Bakery, the one on um, Derby Road, which is just up from the university. And it's one of the busiest um, Sainsbury's locals in the UK. Um, and I found it really stressful, which is what this poem is about. And also um, the irony of having to serve my students who I'd struggled with so much in terms of the privilege when, when I was in first year. Um, and it's a bit of, you know, a bit of tongue in cheek and um, it's meant to be a bit silly really, but it is quite, it is quite a long poem. I'm just gonna make sure that I've got all of my notes for it. Um, right. So let me just make sure I've got them. It's a brilliant poem. So uh, settle back, everybody, uh, and, and, and enjoy. Okay. This is Bakery Blues. What time is it? Please let it be 1am. 
or 3 a.m. But hopefully it's 11 p.m. so that I still have time in bed long enough before my alarm clock goes off not to stress. Because I am a baker and bakeries open for the early breakfaster, which means 3.30 a.m. wake up, even on Sundays. Woefully, due to location, my frequenters consist primarily of pretentious University of Nottingham students with voices of eloquence exaggerated of, I had to be up for an 11 a.m. lecture today and it was so hard. Where's all the pan of chocolates? Oh, cookies are on offer? I love oat and raisin. They're like 70p. I'm literally going to buy them all. Oh my God, please don't buy them all because I really don't want to have to spend the rest of my shift baking more. I hear parasitic fingertips crinkling paper bags, squeezing the goods insides, and I feel violated. But you know what? It's not time for that yet because I am still cozily tucked up in bed. Phone alarm goes off and the sound is gross to my ears. Something like <laughs> out of bed, cold, porridge, dressed, goodbye kiss, walk two miles across the forest, through high and green, past creepy block of flats where a couple of guys shout, Oi, I'm gonna bend you over round the back, love. Comforting dog walker appears. And I feel all right. But down Denman Street Central, he swiftly crumbles and my stomach grumbles insecure again. I keep going and arrive at work before time, about 4.55 because I'm generally early. So I wait, patient, for my manager, who is consistently late to finally arrive, unlock the doors and let me inside. I turn to my right take note of the brown paper bread bags. A is the smallest, D is the largest, but mostly I use the Bs because the breads, they fit in neat, snug and attractive. I guess the bread bags kind of remind me of women's breasts and that my Bs are more than adequate. I mentally and physically phase out in solitary with my little oven. And I guess that's just how it goes in a corporate bakery until I'm going to get two chocolate and hazelnut croissants like the big doggy that I am. Chortles through the wicker baskets as crap out of my, on a particularly bad day of IBS. I am no longer in my space of serenity, but of, excuse me, excuse me, are the taste of difference cookies made using an alcohol-free recipe? Give me warm croissants. Or, uh, she best been wearing gloves. This guy, he is insulting me. And I want to break him in half, dunk him in my tea, just to drown out the sound of him bothering me. Sadly, saliva in my mouth flocks back down my throat, swallowing what I want to say and politely relays. It's against all policy to wear gloves, good sir. <laughs> One carries more germs that way. Rest assured, I am doing all I can to guarantee my cleanliness. I want to slap myself in the face for that pretense. Deflated, I recoil from shop floor back to my enclosure and I feel personally attacked by what I notice next. A half eaten apple core, left hanging about next to my muffins. Take note of the pronoun in use here. My, a form of the possessive case of I, because I am crazy. Possessive of my products and it just riles me up when people take the pistachio out of me and this apple core just hanging about chilling 
casual, as if that's normal or something. I swear, this bakery is an anxiety simulator because I have broken down in this box room before, crying my eyes out like, what am I doing with my life? With my loaves? Jesus Christ. Thank God for that. 6 p.m. I can go home. <laughs> and scene. That was wonderful. Wow, what a, what a classic. That's a classic. Yeah, oh, well done. I, I'm sure everybody enjoyed that. Oh, uh, I hope great. so. And I, I've, I've enjoyed uh, talking with you. Um, that's and, all right. Uh, thank you for being my, my guest. Um, so next week I've got uh, Leanne uh, Moden. Oh, wonderful. You know Leanne, don't you? Leanne. I do. She's so lovely. And she's so she's such a brilliant performer as well. So everyone's in for a treat with Leanne. She is. Uh, she's, very, uh, she's very active on Twitter. She uh, is. She's great. On Twitter. Uh, uh, look her up on Twitter. And uh, I'll, I'll, you're on Twitter, are you, uh, Cleo? I am. I'm on Twitter. Um, it's just at Cleo Asabre. And I'm also on Instagram. Um, I'm not like the massive, I'm not the biggest poster, but I am on there. Okay. Um, and um, uh, so uh, I say do join us uh, next week at noon. Um, uh, thanks to, um, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Inspire, which for the Nottinghamshire Libraries and uh, Nottingham County Council. Thanks again to uh, uh, Metronome and thank to you, Thank you, thank uh, you. Um, and they've all been great. I'm going to finish uh, uh, clear with a poem. So uh, thanks a lot. We'll finish with this. Uh, and then uh, if you stick around, we'll have a little chat afterwards. Okay. All right. Okay. When everybody's gone to bed, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> right. So this is called the Department of Lost Wishes. Forty-nine pounds ninety, said the man with a clipboard. A full refund. Sign here. I I I don't understand. I said, a, a refund of what? Forty-nine pound ninety. That's the total, as far as our records show. He explained. We don't go back beyond decimalization. Wishes made before that date come under a separate department. I, I, I see, uh, I, I muttered, still not understanding. Did, did, did you say wishes? He tapped his pencil impatiently. It's all fully atomized. Wishing wells, fountains, even the 20 pence you once tossed into a canal pretending it to be magical, all refundable, just sign here. But uh, I had hoped uh, someday that the wishes might, uh, I began. He took a closer look at his clipboard and shook his head. I wasn't really uh, expecting, I said, uh, feeling the need for some excuse. I, I was just hoping. £49.90, he offered. It's not the money, uh, I said. I, I was just hoping. Do you want the refund or not? He insisted. I've got many more people to see. I don't think I'll sign, I, I said. He made a note on his clipboard and turning to go, he grumbled. Just once, I'd like a signature. Just once.